Well, welcome and Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. I just want you to know those are the naughty, these are the nice. <laughs> in case you were wondering. And Jesus says to us in Matthew 5, 14 through 16, You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Why does Jesus call us the very thing that he calls himself? In John 8, 12, when he says, I am the light of the world, whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Why does he who is the perfect light say to the imperfect, you are the light? Why? Just somebody say. Does anybody know? It's not a hard question. <laughs> he is hopeful. I think that's true. He's hopeful. We're made in his image. We're made in his image. He dwells in us. He dwells in us. Let's pray. Father, we love you. You are the perfect light. Show us what we need to see. Direct us. Thank you for this moment in time to be together to celebrate the birth of your son who changed the course of history. We lift you up, we honor you, and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. I love the story of Hagar in Genesis 16 for a lot of reasons, but Hagar calls God the light of the world, the God who sees me. A lot of you have probably read this story before, but you have Sarah and Abram. He's not been named Abraham yet, but Sarah and Abram, and they're not able to have a child. And it goes on for years and years that Sarah's unable to have a child. And so finally she gets this idea that Hagar, her servant, should be with Abram, and they would have their family through her. And of course, you know, once that happens and Hagar becomes pregnant, somehow Sarah <laughs> doesn't think the idea is that great anymore. You know, that is sometimes you want something really bad and then it happens and you're like, oh, this isn't quite what I was hoping for. So she does what any reasonable woman would do. She blames Abram. <laughs> <laughs> Then she starts taking it out on Hagar, who flees to the desert. But what happens there? God sends an angel. He sends an angel to her in the desert who brings her good news and instructions about her future. And she goes back to Sarah, her mistress, and uh, she serves her and has Ishmael. So the God who sees us, the perfect light, tells us that we are light. And yet scripture says in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, for now in this earthly realm, we see through a glass darkly. But then we will see clearly when we stand face to face with God. Now I know in part, then I shall know, even as I am also known. I added, but then shall I see, even as also I am seen. Why, if we're light, and light illuminates things, can we only see dimly? Why can we only see part? You guys you know you're not that quiet. <laughs> Ken? How do you like that? Like a teacher calling on a student. <laughs> Why do we only see dimly here in this earthly realm? Some things are not revealed. Imperfect people filled with perfect light. Don't you know there are a lot of examples of imperfect light? I can remember as a kid my mom coming into the room when I was reading and she turned the lights on. You're going to go blind. You're going to lose your eyes. You're going to turn these lights on. Our family has a tradition that we've followed for years. Our home away from home is on Sanibel Island in Florida. And on New Year's Eve at midnight, we like to ride bikes on the bike path that goes around the island. Now, Part of the island is a nature preserve. I just want to paint the picture for you. And all we have to light our way are flashlights, which can be pretty dim because, you know, if your flashlights are like ours, we don't replace the batteries very often, and they're just kind of, yeah. The bike paths are this, you know, they're in a really natural setting. And, I mean, it's a place where you've seen gators, you've seen, 
know, a lot of different animals. So it's, um, you never know. You're riding on the bike path, it's dark. You can see, hear, can hear things moving in the brush. You don't know what they are. So a bright light's really important. There aren't any big street lights. It's very dark. So we started doing these uh, midnight bike rides when our kids were really little, and it's a bit terrifying if you're six. But it makes you feel so alive. And you're so filled with wonder as you follow your small, imperfect light on the pathway. How much more did the shepherds feel alive and filled with wonder as they walked toward the infant Messiah, following a light to the perfect light? <laughs> Second Corinthians 4.18 tells us to fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. David says in Psalm 141, 8, But my eyes are fixed on you, sovereign Lord, the unseen. We're to fix our eyes on the unseen, the sovereign Lord, the perfect light of the world. We who follow him and love him and acknowledge his authority are the light of the world only because his light is in us. So we fix our eyes on him because he is eternal. He alone is life. He alone gives life. And isn't that the story of Jesus? That he came to give us life by literally giving his life? So we fix our eyes on the unseen, the sovereign Lord, and what happens? I'm not going to call on anyone. We begin to see more of the eternal and less of the temporal. Have you ever had that happen in your life? Where you feel like you've touched that little veil that's somewhere between heaven and earth? My dad died four years ago. And on the weekend of his funeral, I had two really interesting conversations with other people who are also lights in the world. One was at the graveside. We were all leaving, and it was a dreary, gray, dark day in Detroit. And uh, just it was just like you would picture a funeral to be. The sun wasn't <laughs> shining. It was just gray. And I saw one of my dad's closest friends as the crowd was kind of leaving. His name is Wally, and Wally had come to the funeral a couple of hours away, he lived a few hours away, come by himself. But he had been a family friend for years. In fact, he and his wife uh, were the master and mistress of ceremonies at our wedding reception. And earlier that day, I had spoken at my dad's funeral. I was really close to my dad. Uh, all my other siblings were worried about handling the emotion of the day. So I was nominated to represent. And there we were at the graveside, and as Ed and I walked toward the car, we saw Wally, who said to me, Al Coonley in a dress. <laughs> That's who you are, Lori. You're Al Coonley in a dress. You reminded me so much of your dad today. Now, my dad was a minister who regularly spoke in front of a lot of people. So I just kind of laughed with Wally, kind of laughed it off, and I told him I would take it as a huge compliment because everybody always loved my dad. The next morning, my sister-in-law, who's also a light in the world, and had no idea what Wally had said to me the day before, informs me that I was part of her dream the night before. She said how clear the dream was, but she wasn't really sure she wanted to tell me about it because she thought it might upset me. Of course, I was all ears. I'm always like the person that sits next to you and goes, you got a secret? So she goes on and she describes how she dreamt about my dad. <coughs> And my dad had a pair of shoes on, and he took them off. And they were these special shoes. They were one of a kind, designed, special. And he took them off, and he asked me to put them on. He told me they wouldn't fit anyone else. So now I'm Al Cooley in a dress with his shoes on. <laughs> a little odd. But four years later, I can still remember their words because I think they saw something I couldn't see. When my dad was living, I'd ask him, how do you decide what things to say yes to and what things to say no to when people ask you to do stuff? Because if you're a public person, you get asked to do a lot of different things. He said, I try to say yes as often as I can because the Lord might use me. My philosophy had always been the opposite. <laughs> Not that I didn't want the Lord to use me, but it was just much easier for me to say no to things for a variety of reasons. I wasn't always the warm, fuzzy type like my dad. But slowly I began to take more risks and step out, even when I wasn't sure. Because you know what? There were moments, glimpses, when I felt like I was witnessing heaven touch the kingdom. The eternal, not the temporal. 
Because that's what happens when we feel the perfect light of the world shining through us. Us, imperfect people. My friend Sarah Batley, who many of you know, recently had a moment where she felt the veil between heaven and earth open. And I asked her to tell about it. Now, she's not well enough to be here. She donated a kidney on Friday. Her, no, take that back, Thursday. I saw her on Friday. And um, I just think it's so appropriate that at Christmas, when we're talking about Christ who gives life, talking about somebody who's helping to give life in an actual way. I brought a flashlight because she sent me this on her email. It's very small. <laughs> Plus, I was talking about flashlights that all tied in. That's how the spirit works. Okay. It's called Kidneys and Christmas. Tidings of comfort and joy. Comfort and joy. I've always been a thrill seeker and thus a joy seeker. When I was eight years old, my hand shot in the air at the question, who would be willing to be draped with this six-foot boa constructor around their neck? As I stood there with this snake draped over me, I felt joy. Maybe just in the fact that I was alive. And she puts in parentheses, they no longer do these stunts at amusement parks. <laughs> when I heard about Marsha, my dear friend's sister's health crisis, I was concerned. She was my age, had two young boys, lived and worked on a farm that she loved. She loved cooking and eating like I do and had a laughter, a joy about her that was compelling. I'd only met Marsha a couple of times, but that was enough. To hear of someone suffering and enduring pain and symptoms unimaginable, compelled many people to pray and ask the necessary question, what can we do? When it became obvious that Marcia's situation was critical and a kidney transplant was the most hope-filled option for her health and future, something stirred in my heart. Just like my hand shooting up in the air that day at Bush Gardens, pick me. When it was evident that her family members were unable to donate due to medical reasons, I casually, on the outside, inquired about donating. I emailed the University of Maryland Donor Services the day I was given the information. This is not my nature. I would normally lose the email and have to ask for it two or three times, then forget to email, just like I always forget to write my compassion child. <laughs> There's no judgment here. This was different. I filled out the 15 pages of paperwork promptly and wondered why it took them so long to get back to me. Each step of the way, and there were many, I was prompted to respond and something else started happening, joy and peace. Every time I had to give blood, collect urine, try to do that for 24 hours, fill out the paperwork again, they lost my initial paperwork, joy and peace. I cannot describe this any better than to think about the last time you experienced an emotion that you wanted to capture and when the moment ends, you spend the rest of your time trying to get back to that joy. So, three weeks ago, when we got the phone call that the surgery was set for December 20th, you can imagine the joy at the thought of being a part of this chain of kidney giving and receiving that would culminate, culminate in Marsha receiving a kidney. It's all part of a paired kidney exchange. It's a wild thing. One person gives a kidney, that goes to somebody else. So the person that you're giving your kidney to is someone you don't even know. So that the person you do know will eventually, it's pretty, pretty wild. Each of my boys kept asking me if I was nervous, and I kept saying, I will be soon. I know that it's coming, but it didn't. The peace endured and the joy, but this was all prior to the surgery. So when I was rolled into the OR, 6.30 a.m., Thursday, December 20th, I was filled with peace until two old enemies knocked at the door, fear and anxiety. They reminded me that waking up from anesthesia was the time I should really be afraid of. My whole life, I've been afraid of being untethered and saying something that's really on my mind for the world to hear, stuff that would reveal what a fake I am, like, hey, I really do like McDonald's. <laughs> I have this crazy fear of losing control. Somehow the potential pain of the surgery and medication of the anesthesia terrified me. So as I drifted off to sleep, I surrendered these enemies into the hands of a loving father, and I was completely unprepared for what was to follow. I woke up in the post-op about 9.30. I know that because I asked what time it was, and then it began. The best way that I can describe the following two hours is that my heart was filled with gratitude, like a symphony of gratitude. Like C.S. Lewis, it was as if I was in a land 
that I was created to be in and would spend the rest of my days trying to get back to. Like one of those dreams where you think you're shouting and you awake to find not even a whisper has been uttered. I was shouting thank you to God for everything and everyone, all of my world, all of the people and the struggles and the beauty and the heartache and the goodness and the mystery. I was so grateful. I kept asking Kathy, my nurse, what time is it? I wanted a tangible reminder that I was still tethered to earth while given the gift of this journey to a very thin place, a place where heaven touches earth and the ground is sacred, a place like Bethlehem. When Mike came in at noon to see me, all I could say was, I've spent two hours in thankfulness. While the tears fell in my groggy state, I was keenly aware that this whole journey of kidneys and friends and sisters and medical advances was a tapestry that God was weaving for me of the reality of Christmas morning, of the joy of sacrifice, and the peace of following his adventurous journey. Kidneys and Christmas. Mike, can you just stand up and give us an update on how Sarah's doing? Um, she's, uh, obviously she's home. She's uh, tender, shuffling around, uh, nothing out of the ordinary. And, um, Thank you. Keep praying for her. Um, just a quick uh, update. Everybody's doing great who received a kidney. And Marsha, who literally would have died without it, was just up the hall from where Sarah's room was. And they got to meet and talk about the surgery and uh, we're hoping that her body continues to receive uh, the kidney. But it is this beautiful, she received a kidney from someone that didn't know anyone in the chain. 27 year old guy just wanted to give a kidney. It's amazing. So what do we need to ask the light of the world to show us? What do we need to see that we can't see right now? Something in us, something in someone else? Do you tell people when you see something in them? Do you tell them? A relationship we need to reconcile, one we need to end, something we're being called to. Are we watching? Are we listening? Are we expecting? Are we fixing our eyes on the perfect light of Jesus? One of my favorite stories in the Old Testament is the account of the prophet Elisha and his servant. It's a beautiful passage. It's in 2 Kings chapter 6. The king of Aram is at war with Israel, and Elisha is telling the king of Israel all of Aram's plans, because prophets can do that. They kind of know what's going to happen. And so Aram's getting very angry, because he doesn't know how everybody knows his plans. So he calls in all of his guys, his officers, and he wants to know, okay, who's spilling all my secrets to the king of Israel? They say, not us. It's Elisha. He knows the very words you say in your bedroom. So Aram tells his officers to capture Elisha, and he sends horses and chariots to surround the city where Elisha is. So the next morning, Elisha's servant gets up. He goes to the window, and he sees this huge army surrounding the city. And he's terrified, and he looks at Elisha. He says, oh, no, my lord, what shall we do? And Elisha says, don't be afraid. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then he asked God to open his servant's eyes so that he can see the unseen, so that he can see the spiritual reality of his situation. And the Lord opens his eyes, and the servant sees the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha protecting him. He can't even see Aram's officers anymore. Not because they're not there, but because God is greater than those stand against us. As a follower of Christ, I don't go anywhere alone. There is an army of heavenly hosts with me. I want to walk and live in his strength with that picture in mind. It's been said that we don't see things as they are, we see them as we are. <laughs> Isn't it true? We're always seeing how things are affecting us. The world, according to us, how is it affecting me? The news did a great job of that, even with the shooting of all those children. Talking about how it's affecting us. Whenever there's a change at work, many of us know that there's been a lot of them in the last few years. My boss will say to me, the only thing people really care about is how does this affect me? How does this affect me? Shouldn't it be different if we're living with the perfect light of the world in us? 
Shouldn't we be asking a bigger question like, what's God doing? Where's God in all of this? How can I bring God's light to somebody who's being affected by this? And it's not like I say that that's an easy thing to do. I don't do it. When Ed lost his job, my husband last January, was my first question, what's God up to? It was, how will this affect me? How will this affect my life? What's going to happen to our family? How am I going to have to change? What are we going to do? I eventually got around to wondering what God might have in this, but it took some time. And I want to get to him quicker the next time. I want to get to him quicker the next time. I want to spend more time seeing what's unseen. So I'm trying to pay more attention. I'm asking God to show me what it is he wants me to see, what it is I cannot see. If we go back to 1 Corinthians 13, 12, one Bible commentator says that the reference to seeing through a glass darkly was based on clear polished stones that were used as lenses or windows. One second century rabbi said, all the prophets had a vision of God as he appeared through nine lenses, but Moses saw God through one. Maybe Moses had a clearer picture of God because he spent so much time with him. Maybe we're afraid of the perfect light. He'll show us too much or he'll ask us to do something that we think we can't. So instead, we chase after imperfect light and we settle for just a part of the picture, a small part of the plan. Just a sip from his beautiful overflowing cup as we walk through the dust of our days, carrying flashlights with batteries that are dying. Father, help us to have the courage to fix our eyes on you, to sit with you, and to know you more so that your light can illuminate our lives and those who are around us. Show us what you want us to see. Show us what we can't see. Help us to speak into others as we see things that they can't see. (coughs) Thank you for being our comforter and our counselor. The one perfect light. In Jesus' name, amen.